this is quite a challenge because of the um, wide interdisciplinarity of the ICS and therefore I hope this is of interest to everybody but technically it cannot go into the concerns of the philosophers, the concerns of the people who study the, the family and social values, uh, but we can discuss these things in much greater detail this afternoon. What I'd like to do to, to start with is just to give you an overview of what I'm going to cover. Is the sound working okay for everybody? Good. Uh, so I want to start with where we got, as academics, our first ideas of culture from, and I mean this in terms of the history of our disciplines. Uh, and to argue very strongly, and of course this is disputed, as everything is in the social sciences, uh, but my point of view is that things have changed dramatically even from a hundred years ago or less when the Americans in particular were talking about socialization. Uh, anthropology of course has changed out of recognition. We now have people who do field studies on modern societies, modern enclaves, ways of life, ethnographies. Um, accepting that they will find different things in different places which are changing very rapidly over time. Very little fixity, this is the one, one major thing that has gone. And therefore, in many of the textbooks that um, students, particularly doing their first degrees, uh, consult, they find a particular image of socialization uh, which is based upon replication. You learn the values, the beliefs, the aims and objectives, even the preference schedules of your parents and you go out and you duplicate them. Um, and I want to argue that that model is based upon some very, very special and specific uh, social conditions in culture, structure, and agency. Uh, because if I have one conviction as, as a general social theorist, it's that any explanation of things social, you can say this in English, it comes in a sack, S-A-C, structure, agency, and culture. There is no explanation that can dispense with one of these three elements. Because <coughs> structurally, we all live and make decisions and do things and think things and believe things in a context. There is no such thing as context-free action. Oh, people can call it a different word. They can call it, they don't need to say context. They can say situation. Fine. That's not the argument. The argument is <clears throat> that the situation always has properties, opportunities, constraints, enablements, and we cannot theorize without reference to where people are situated. Equally, so all activity is con context dependent. Equally, all the things that we think about the context we are born into, the context we grow up within, the context we would like to see as representing the good life for everybody, uh, is dependent upon cultural concepts of what is a good life. And these never were 
completely consensual, as we all know. But if I have an argument, it's that they are becoming less and less consensual, and some of them <coughs> are becoming very contested indeed. The most common one throughout Europe, of course, including the United States, including Switzerland, neither of which are European, <laughs> in the organizational sense. Um, well, take religion. I mean, in all those countries, religion is more and more presented as something that should be excluded from public life and just become a matter of private conviction, like your sporting preferences or your dietary preferences, but it should not enter the public arena. Um, and there are, there are many of these, these variations, whereas a whole series of issues, which you all know perfectly well, now dominate the, the public arena, discourse of politics, of democracy, uh, issues of, of gender, um, issues of, um, well, concepts such as sex and gender, which used to be taken as very clear, are now very mixed up, very contested. Um, and all of this has to be uh, introduced into both the developmental experience of the child in, in growing up and in our own experience because which of these things do we, these new issues, do we accommodate? How do we accommodate them? Are we simply politically correct, which is a bureaucratic way of dealing with the governance of these issues, or are we contestatory? And it seems we are both, because if you take gay marriage in, in Europe, every European country, um, particularly France and, and Spain and Italy, have had major, major demonstrations against this. So we have no consensus at the social level uh, about these changing sorts of issues. So I want to argue this is because the conditions for consensuality have transformed <coughs> completely. And the, this in turn means that socialization is much more difficult for the young subject and involves a lot more reflexivity on their part about precisely, and I'm just keeping this in everyday language, what do you accept from your, from your background? And I'm using background <coughs> to cover your family, your extended family, your neighborhood, the first school, schools that you go to that you, the subject, do not choose, they are chosen for you. <coughs> Already, the young subject is doing a lot of work, having to do a lot of work, trying to integrate these different influences. And then I'd like to come up to, um, to date, as it were, and look at how this process is still not complete when older subjects, but they're still young, come up to university. That they are not fully formed in any sense. Socialization has become a lifelong experience because, precisely, culture is changing from day to day, sometimes dramatically, uh, sometimes in, in minor ways, but every day is some kind of cultural challenge. So a big challenge um, in, in British universities, or maybe just in my own, I don't know for the dating. But one day in 1990, we walked into our offices and 
No, nobody greeted us. The Secretary of Staff seemed to have vanished. And instead, there was a big desktop computer and no instruction manual. <laughs> so for two years, you know, we became autodidacts. We have a new, this is why I regard practice as the practical order as a separate order. We inherit the material culture of previous generations. And in the case of my generation, 1990 was when we got the latest cultural arrival, the desktop computer. And you don't need me to tell you, this has gone on and on and on. Every time, well, I open my iPad in the hotel this morning, and what is it trying to do? It's trying to sell me new apps, new applications. And this is what we sell our young people. Some new piece of material culture is coming at them from all directions, and they have two jobs to do. One is to choose, do I want to get involved with this? We are, as academics, offered every week some new facility that will transform our ways of doing our job. Uh, most of them we reject. We've got quite enough icons on our desktops, not to need more. <coughs> um, some of them we accept because we're going to, for example, be using PowerPoint this morning. PowerPoint is already very out of date. <laughs> and there are many more <coughs> dynamic ways of, of doing, yeah, very many. But of course, there is, you could say, a cultural lag. Reflexivity takes time. We used to have, structurally, plenty of time when we were doing things that were not very demanding, like you know, walking from the bus stop onto campus or sitting on the metro. And we would be thinking, we would not necessarily be thinking about our ultimate concerns. We might be thinking about our shopping list for the family or for ourselves. Um, but we would be mentally active and we would probably be doing some rather sophisticated activities um, which are often represented as being unsophisticated, such as shopping. We were talking about this last night over at uh, Uh The shopping is not just an individual <coughs> activity where you take money and you spend it in a process of commodification, marketization, financialization. Um, it can be a very relational activity if you're shopping for more than one person, where you are considering the relational benefits of each person who is going to be eating what you purchase, Does it fit their dietary requirements, their personal preferences? Does it provide a con the ingredients for a congenial meal? Or are you actually making a decision for what goes into your shopping trolley that we will not eat together? that we are buying for what the Americans call the generation who grazes. They don't sit down and eat together. Um, they just go to the refrigerator and take out what they want, when they want. Um, and as one anthropologist um, once said, commensality, eating together, is just as important as conjugality living and sleeping together. It's what bonds the, the family, the people living, they don't have to be a family, the people living together uh, as some kind of friendship unit. Um, so all of these things have changed, but let me get back to um, doing this systematically. Was that sort of understandable as a an overview in everyday language. I was trying not to use any 
technical terminology. Okay, well, let's go back to the in the beginning. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but I caught a bit of a cold on the plane and uh, dehydration is the result. In the beginning, um, my own particular beginning as a student at all the places that Professor Anamata uh, mentioned, uh, we were taught by anthropologists about culture. And I, I am not being disrespectful. Some of them are great um, pioneers of their day. But unfortunately, they brought back one message. Um, the message of cultural cohesion, culture as something shared, culture as something homogeneous. And this is very clear if you go to the great anthropologists of the 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, it's summed up in Evans Pritchard talking about the Azandi. Every Zandi is born into the tribe. He, sorry, it's not inclusive language. Um, he acquires the beliefs, the vocabulary, the skills of the tribe. He thinks with the tribe, this is the key bit, and he cannot think that his thinking is wrong. He is so deeply integrated. And you find that theme, I traced it at the beginning, well, there's an article called The Myth of Social Integration in the British Journal of Sociology. It's also chapter one of Culture and Agency, and it just goes through the anthrop anthropologists from um, Evans Pritchard, um, through Franz Boas, Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, and again and again and again, uh, you find this single <laughs> message that cultures are integrated. And everybody shares them. And this is the same right up to today in somebody like Clifford Geertz. I don't know if you, you read him here very much. Uh, that we're talking about a shared practice. Well, my argument is quite the opposite, that as we have developed from the earliest societies, in one way, Durkheim was right. People did share in the earliest societies. Durkheim, somewhere in elementary forms, have, has a lovely statement that uh, everybody in a segmented society carries everything, every part of culture that he or she or they need for survival. And so there were no specific practices of socialization. Um, it can be done by imitation. It can be done by gradual induction of the child into the agricultural, predominantly agricultural means of production. Um, and everybody knows roughly the same things that their neighbors know. Well, to me, that Durkheimian image was always very well counterbalanced by what Durkheim went on to write in the Division of Labor in particular, um, that as modernity engages, as skills differentiate, as functional differentiation, becomes the primary means of social division, uh, people share less and less. And because they do so, <clears throat> I personally would give De Durkheim the credit for having <coughs> the first sociologist come anthropologist. Yes, I know he never did field work. <laughs> he read books. Uh, he was the first to say this is intimately related to the problem of social integration. Because the moment people start having different skills, doing different things, 
things, believing different things, what holds them together? What stops a breakdown into the sort of next stage of the representation of culture in our disciplines? Uh, what Talcott Parsons was the first to call institutionalized individualism. So no longer are we talking about the whole tribe, the whole community shares the same culture. No, we're talking about a very individualistic thing in which you take, and culture is getting, what I call the cultural system is getting bigger and bigger. More material artifacts are being added to it, more ideas and theories, <coughs> beliefs are being added to it. And whilst this may have been the case across the world, before the world was globalized, uh, what they knew, we didn't know. And what we knew, those over there didn't know either. Uh, that image, too, has, as we say, passed its cell by date. It's over. Um, <laughs> And this has set a problem that I think our social sciences have not dealt with very well. They have tried to hang on to old models of how you cope with this intensity of cultural change and structural change. Uh, globalization above all is a structural change and the key bit for socialization the change in the human subject, a gentle change. Um, so, <coughs> what are the conditions for this traditional form of socialization where really it is a matter of being inducted into the common beliefs, values, um, theories um, held by other people. Well, I touched on one of these already. The new context I want to put this in <laughs> is one in which we have much greater connectivity. Um, so instead of we believe this and they believe that but we don't know it and the others believe something else and we don't know that either connectivity means that we do know we may not share but we do know um hence all the debates that we have about culture and politics and discourse and so on if we didn't know about these we couldn't debate them uh, <clears throat> what we lose Going back to me talking about theorizing always as in a sack, what we lose is the structural commonality, the same structural base from which we start learning things. If any of you have read any of my trilogy on reflexivity, I call it um, contextual continuity. What I tried to illustrate on this first film scene using um, George Herbert Mead and his concept of the generalized other. Uh, well, for, for two reasons. Firstly, he was very clear. Um, and secondly, um, he and the other three great American pragmatists, uh, Peirce above all, my hero, as it were, uh, but also Dewey and uh, uh, earlier uh, William James, who was very relevant to, to this, um, they all made reference uh, to the inner conversation or the internal conversation <coughs> or what I'm calling these days reflexivity. And for some reason, um, whilst many Americans, and they haven't given me a very satisfactory answer, so we've had um, Mead, Dewey, and Peirce 
talking at length about people having internal conversations, reflexive discourse inside their heads, sometimes externalized with other people. Um, but this seems to have dropped out of American sociology altogether. And it's a puzzle to me why. The best answer I can come up with, which is probably inadequate, is to blame Parsons for it. But we blame him for everything, so this is probably unfair. But since he believed that so firmly there was a central value system, then you didn't need to have reflexive deliberations inside your own head. It was really like the old-fashioned telephone exchange where you just plugged in to the exchange and you found out what the generalized other of your society um, thought about whatever the issue was in question. Um, now this, I think, is more and more demanding because it's less and less the, the case. Um, sorry, I'm flashing the, the cable and don't want to. Okay, there he's gone. Um, so the three conditions. Uh, so this is asking what what do the general conditions have to be in order for the experience of the individual subject to be one that can lead them just to internalize society's culture. Well, the first one is very simple. A high level of socio-cultural integration, what I've been talking about five minutes ago. Um, <coughs> sorry. Thank you. Is that better? Yeah. I'll hold it. Uh, I'll pull it even further. That's better. No problem? Good. <coughs> well, that is necessary as a general condition for socialization if young subjects are going to receive consensual messages. They have to come from people here who agree about religion, politics, the market, regionality, whatever it may be, migration. Um, and only if that's, uh -uh, sorry, only if that's the case can you get the same messages being sent to the people who are being socialized. For them to make anything out of these messages, you also need a stable, functional <coughs> differentiation uh, within society. Now, the reason for mentioning Durkheim was he's often presented as the worried man of the Third Republic. He's well aware, well, how could you not be in France? Uh, you know, in the 1890s, that it had tried every kind. Um, I think it's David Thompson who, who says this in his history. France had tried <laughs> every experiment of political regime, not once but twice <laughs> since the French Revolution. Uh, so, no wonder Durkheim was worried. More surprising is that more people were not worried for the same reasons. <clears throat> um, and he saw that this went not just in terms of politics, change of regime, republic one day, um, back, back to the restoration of the monarchy and so on and so forth, um, but that it was affecting uh, jobs and skills, hence his choice of calling the book The Division of Labour. Why is the division of labour so important for political stability? If it's stable, <coughs> sorry, give me the wrong thing. Um, if the functional division differentiation of labour is stable, fine. You get clear and durable 
role expectations. So anybody wanting to become a teacher when they leave um, university or college, uh, they know what to expect <coughs> in a lot of detail. So let's stay with France because we're talking about Durkheim and he was a professor of pedagogy, not a professor of sociology. Um, <coughs> these are very, very clear indeed, partly because France has an exceptionally uh, centralized educational system, but so do you, so does Italy, let's face it, so does anywhere that Napoleon conquered, because the first thing he did was to put a relative on the throne, and the second thing was to impose the Université Imperiale, just his name for the French educational system, on all of his conquests. Many of them kept it, modified it, but basically kept it centralized. Unlike somewhere like Britain, where it just grew up as a mess, and it remains a mess. <laughs> um, so, yes, you know what to be as a teacher, you know how to get there. There's another, another lovely saying in, in, in French. Uh, it's a bit apocryphal and exaggerated. Um, it takes three generations to move from being an instituteur, a primary school teacher, to becoming a professeur, universitaire, in the university. But this was... Uh, stop it, woman. Uh, this was known. You could calculate it for it, you could plan for it. And a lot of this is there, embedded in Bourdieu's theorizing, where parents do many strategic things to preserve the standing, the status of the, of the family, because they know what to do. So if you're a middle-class parent uh, and you have a child who is not academically spectacular, well, you can think strategically, okay, what are the role expectancies? What are the roles available that can allow that child to have a decent middle class, bourgeois standard of living, no dishonor to the family, but no great academic demands either? And Bourdieu, in the beginning, was very, very good with his examples of how they find these niches, cordon bleu cooking, <laughs> for example. And, yeah, we all love the products of it, so this is no loss of, of status. Probably more interesting to meet a, a child of your friends who is a chef um, than it is to meet one who is a primary school teacher. At least you might enjoy the products directly. And then the final general condition of there being a generalized other was that the cultural system itself should be integrated. See, I see the, the cultural system as, uh, well, I used to call it uh, the, the Great Universal Library. This is pre-1990 when um, the digitalization started up and now we have to call it the Great Universal Archive. And each day as something was being put into the library, well each second something is being put into the digital archive. <coughs> so culture is nothing stable, it's something growing exponentially. And as it grows, that has implications for the growth of knowledge and for the philosophy of social science. So I once had the huge privilege of um, being the last cohort of students that Karl Popper lectured to <coughs> before he retired. And one of the things I'll never forget that Karl Popper said was, we do not understand all the implications of any single proposition. We can't, because there are connections we just 
never think of making. But there are complementarities out there, items that are lodged in the archive but are not brought together, and there are contradictions, things that if you do bring them together, um, you have difficulties. Um, but it's only if you have high cultural systems integration that you get normative consistency throughout a society such that it works just like your old early society did. Now, I don't think any of those conditions actually maintain any longer. And they mean that, I'll just illustrate it from George Herbert Mead, not because I particularly want to criticize him, I think he's one of the best, uh, but he is also one of the clearest, and that helps. Um, the points here, which Mead had the integrity himself to be worried about, is, well, first of all, you could not assume, I'll just work down the right-hand side of the um, frame rather than getting up and down. Um, he did assume that there was a relatively high degree of um, sociocultural integration because of his long society on block. They belong to a neighborhood, to a region, maybe, he says, even to a gang, a class, or a corporation. Well, if that's the case, hasn't he set up a problem for himself about um, culture being shared, and shared um, very harmoniously? Because if people are divided by gangs, let's say, or corporations, and we'll call them banks, uh, are these not in conflict with one another, in competition with one another? In other words, far from being consensual, are they not locked in some kind of combat? Seems to me they are. If somebody extends their, their turf for selling drugs, well, they have reduced the other person's turf. Uh, somebody dominates the market as a bank through the sale of derivatives or hedge funds uh, and they have diminished the share of the market by other banks and institutional investors. So if that, if there's anything in my critique which I'm not have transferred to go into in detail, um, <coughs> why is there not a problem for the persons being socialized in this conflict of values and meanings that they are confronted with. And this is never really dealt with either by Mead or by his successor. Um, he does recognize that things are changing. He even talks about the global expansion of capitalism and capitalist markets. So you could say he was one of the, uh, both in economics, in, in identifying what was to become the multinational enterprise, <coughs> and in politics, in the huge optimism he had for the League of Nations, um, that he is diagnosing some of the trends that are going to destroy the generalized other as a source of normative reference and socialization. And so he actually says uh, about capitalist geographical expansion, quote, um, this is the most universal socializing factor in our whole modern society because the economic process goes right on, tending to bring people closer together. Well, yeah, in one way, we're closer together in that, take something trivial, well, it's not so trivial. Um, take the shirts or um, 
jumpers that, that, that we are all wearing today. Yeah, we are globally closer together because the fibre was grown somewhere, it was spun somewhere else, it was dyed somewhere else, it was made up, retailed in a very, very long um, chain, very complex chain, um, and in many ways a very non-consensual chain because at each of these stages <coughs> there is a lot of exploitation, summed up in that dreadful photograph of the Bangladesh clothing factory about six weeks ago, which just collapsed. It was so atrociously built. I think 160 or something like that. Workers, clothing workers just died. So what does closer together mean? Um, closer in the sense of being able to exploit or closer in the sense of being able to form community? You know? Two very, very different things. Um, and he recognizes that this expansionary economy um, is. Can have him? No, we don't need that yet. Um, that this expansionary economy is one which does make this process of taking on the attitude of the generalized other much more difficult. When your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather you know, tended the sheep and looked after the cows in much the same way, um, yes, you could enter into their attitudes. You didn't ask the question in autumn, late autumn, why is he bringing the, the sheep down the hillside? You knew perfectly well, because winter is coming and sheep do not do very well when there's nothing to eat and it's snow covered up there. Um, but Mead, who is a very honest man, I find it impossible to dislike him. He says, when this happens, when these huge multinational changes take place, the economy, the expansionary economy, represents a whole in which it will be next to impossible for all to enter into the attitudes of all others. I mean, it's completely true. Mm -hmm. um, I can talk about the weaving of, of fibers in many Asiatic countries. I can't empathize because I don't know Asiatic fiber weaver, weavers, um, vice versa. They don't know Brazilian workers who are fitting together <coughs> new material artifacts, the components that make up computers and mobile phones, so on and so forth. So, the big question for Mead, to put to Mead, is what now binds the personal I to the community rather than to sectional interests such as the clothing industry and making a profit in it, um, and ideas such as all the people in my region tend to believe variants on the same thing. Yes, we have devout Buddhists and tepid Buddhists non-practicing, probably, Buddhists. <coughs> There's still variations on Buddhism. Uh, now we have multiculturalism, which is a theory that got nowhere, so I won't go into it. Um, then you have a major problem. Me tries to rescue, he, he really wants to, to be an optimist. He's one of these thinkers whose glass is always half full, it's never half empty. And he sees something in religion fostering consensus through the very universalism of religious ideas, whichever they are. Now probably this is not true any longer because some of the 
stranger, weirder cults that believe in unidentified flying objects, etc. Um, it, it's hard to think of them as part of universalistic religion, though I suppose since they see these as intergalactic, they could have an argument about this. Um, so what he literally says is that the universalistic ideas of religion foster a normative consensus, well, empirical questions there. How did they do it anyway? By, and this is a very strange argument, by appealing to posterity, quote, to endorse a higher sort of community, the community of the whole of the human race, the whole of humankind, um, which outvotes the community we find ourselves in. <coughs> I, I can see what he's getting at there. But the problem is that the different kinds of religion, denomination, sect, cult, are making different appeals, and some of those appeals are completely contradictory. There's one obvious one that comes up in, um, in medicine quite, quite regularly with the, uh, is it the um, Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. Who will not have blood transfusion? Yes. So that yes. is one problem they present for medical personnel. Yes. Do we let the patient die or do we respect the strange belief of, of the Jehovah's Witness? There are many, many examples of, of, of that kind. So, to move on, am I taking too long? I'm going too slowly. Just for one, uh, okay. Uh, well, to move to the next stage, uh, since all of this um, means that what I've, I've really been arguing is about the morphogenesis of culture, meaning the progressive increase in uh, the amount of culture, I hate using that term amount, because what is a cultural unit, how do you measure it? But we can still talk about, there are more ideas, theories, uh, scientific procedures, books to be read, novels, etc., than there were. There are computers when there were none, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the next stage in the argument is that for socialization, this presents two problems to the young subject. There is such a lot of this culture, whether it is pure ideas or whether it's part of practical life um, as material artifacts. Um, and it is growing all the time. Because of this tendency that I'm working on at the, the moment, um, that the variety of culture stimulates more variety. And you can see this if you follow, um, in any serious sense, um, developments in, in digital science. Uh, every day there is some new leap forward. Uh, and these represent not just scientific achievements or practically useful um, pieces of software, they also represent new opportunities for the young in terms of new jobs that they can do. I mean, computer software technician, university technician uh, simply didn't exist two, three generations ago or at least it meant the man, usually man, who changed the light bulbs and put new plugs in. Now it means something very different. So new jobs, new organizations, uh, it 
was it, it has been a problem empirically <coughs> for uh, throughout Europe. Um, how you conduct the census, the population census, and how you code the occupations within it. Because half of the occupations, if you ask people what is your job, and they just write it in, well, if somebody writes in um, logistician, I do logistics, what did that compare with in his parental generation? It didn't exist. I write software. It didn't exist. Uh, so new jobs, new organizations, and new relations. Uh, because there have been some very interesting studies, for example, of how people working in digital science within universities, so the same setting as ours, they don't work in the same structure of unit. So we tend to think of departments and subsections of departments and themes within them. And they work in a terribly different way. I mean, they're not recognizable um, in terms of, of dress. You know, they're sort of wandering in their sweatshirts and their dirty trainers. They don't expect to have my area, my office, my, they just kind of wander around and sit down when they have a bright idea and uh, drink a lot more coffee and on they go. It's um, just a different way of working. It's basically absolutely nothing wrong with it, but it's not what we have done. So these represent in sum many more opportunities for young um, people entering the market there is actually no authoritative source of normativity that guides the selections that, that they make. <coughs> um, there used to be many of these. I mean, one was a school teacher themselves. Now we have, throughout most of Europe, vocational guidance departments, specialists in directing kids to know what there is out there. We used to have um, sources within the community. I mean, parish priests would say it's uh, not a job that actually benefits humankind very much if you just want to go and um, I don't know, produce expensive consumer goods. Um, whereas, have you thought about working in a hospital or whatever? So there's a necessity of selection. This is the, the, the bottom line. The, the young subject themselves has to pick what they care about out of this array of things. The, the lifetime is far too short to do all of them. Um, we are not all equally skilled in dexterity and inclination. Some people are good linguists and so on and so forth. Uh, so how do we do it? We've got choice, but choice can sometimes be an embarrassment. On the right of the chess, as, as the French put it. <laughs> um, well, this is where I find Charles Taylor uh, very helpful. And um, another American philosopher, probably less well known in Europe. Empirically, I've discovered, I was talking to Anna Mata just before we started, uh, cases where there have been up to six people, ex-wives, ex-husbands, um, ex-lovers, etc. But six people in this thing that some sociologists of the family call the amalgamated family. Um, you know, two of his, two of mine, and one of ours is the standard definition. I'm not trying to be flippant, but they talk this way. Um, and so six people plus the relatives in law all think they have the right to say something that you wouldn't say to strangers uh, to their child who is a relative. But the problem is 
if you take, let's just restrict it to six, which it won't be restricted to, they'll be saying things that represent mixed messages to the child. And the child has to sort this out for themselves. Now, this may be completely trivial, and maybe it's always existed. Triviality. This Christmas, uh, my first granddaughter, and um, I gave her a pair of, 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 of dungarees and a matching top because they, they live in Chamonix in the mountains. And the other grandmother gave her a frilly tutu. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is saying something important which can lead to family disagreements. I've given you a really trivial one. Um, we wouldn't fight over that. In fact, the mother just put the frilly tutu in a cupboard and said, should never wear that. Um, okay, but you know, when it's over something more important, and some of the important things were, were medical, for example, um, I don't know whether you, you, you had this um, here in the Basque country, the huge debate over the, the three uh, inoculations um, against mumps, measles. Uh, yes, <laughs> well, three um, easily contracted diseases that, that can have very bad um, lifelong consequences for the trial. But there was one of those medical debates um, you know, about whether it was good to give the three in one, well, less distress, yes, less problem, but interaction was what they were worried about. And so some parents did, some didn't, and some parents had fights over, some extended families had fights over this. Uh, so, you know, we're getting more serious about the mixed messages and, and where they can lead. Um, so, how do Frankfurt and, and Taylor try and help us, help the subject, but help us to conceptualize what the young subject is doing in being socialized through mixed messages? Well, obviously, they need to select, but they need to shape a life. And I, I find this very helpful. Um, that it starts off with uh, the young subject has to identify what matters to them. Uh, for some, you know, ponies matter a great deal. This is very British. The pony and the dog <laughs> can matter a great deal. For others, uh, you know, it's, it's my friends, it's street life, it's skateboarding. Again, innocent things, but they're different. So the answer to what matters to me is also different. Because more than one thing matters to a subject, they then have a second problem of how do they, how do they care about these concerns together? How do they make them, I'm using this awkward English word dovetail, um, mesh, gel, and it, it's not easy because some don't. Mm. Again, talking about completely innocent things. <coughs> For example, it's very difficult to be a dedicated academic, that's one of your, your top priorities, and simultaneously a top sporting competitor. That is just are not enough hours in the day to do it. How do we deal with it? Well, on the whole, since we're talking about things that are quite innocent, nobody will criticize us for, for doing both, but we subordinate one. We say, okay, my ultimate concern, let's say for somebody, is my academic life. And most of my eyes, ours, sorry, will go on this, and therefore my sporting life will deteriorate but I will keep it up because I enjoy it. And so they will, um, they will not compete, but 
but they will be there doing it as a weekend leisure activity. You know, the people who paint, we have a, the phrase, the Sunday, pa the Sunday afternoon painter in England. So you're never going to be the great artist, but you'll still get your enjoyment and so on, and they're perfectly compatible. Uh, the problem comes, of course, when they're not compatible, and we have to ask, how do they solve the problem of selecting out of the things that do matter for them, prioritizing, which means putting one as number one, so on down the list, and so I'm going to suggest that this is where family relations are extremely important. And that, in a nutshell, the more relational goods... You see, what, sorry, just let me backtrack one sentence. Um, good as Frankfurt and Charles Taylor, and helpful as they are, they're still only talking about individuals. They're not there's not a great deal of relationality in their work at all. Indeed, Frankfurt becomes rather contradictory when he starts talking about the things a couple would like, where he says the wise thing is not to have children at all because you may start to quarrel about who takes care of them. And then in the next sentence he's saying, but one of the greatest goods in life can be having a child, and that may be necessary, or beneficial for the relationship between a couple. Uh, so there's not a great deal of help here. So I'm going to link it indeed to the natal contexts in which they are brought up uh, and suggesting that the kind of relationality within the family has a very profound effect, I still don't want to say a deterministic effect, upon the kind of reflexivity that they practice and the kinds of selections they make against opportunities that are available. You could express it as a little diagram which is there in the book, but it gives you four categories uh, that the young people who are closest to their um, parents receive most relational goods in the family. These are warm, close, um, loving families. Uh, they are the ones who will produce the statement, I want my family to be very much the same as the one that I grew up in. Uh, they, when they get to university, and all universities offer new students a vast array of activities, societies, student societies that they could belong to, again, the necessity of selection. How does the identifier who belongs to uh, a family that produces a lot of relational goods, how do they deal with this choice of opportunities? Well, quite simply, they turn their backs on a lot of them. They don't want many of the new opportunities because the new opportunities, if they took advantage of them, would mean that their families would not be much like mine. They would become different, very different people. Secondly, I'm going rather fast through this. We can come back to it this afternoon. Um, in families where there has been a lot of difficulty, uh, separation of the parents, remarriage of, of, of the parents, one parent drifting off, a succession of relationships, whatever, um, these disruptive dynamics induce a lot of self-distancing on the part of the, the child um, who, when you start interviewing them as students, will say things like, well, you know, uh, father was interested in his photography, mother in her job. For me, it was cars. And 
and they will indeed have become very proficient at car maintenance and all the rest of it. What they send, tend to do then in the re receiving these parental mixed messages is to pick and mix. Pick from all the influences something or nothing that is matter, that matters to them and then see how it can live together with other things that they have mixed. But the key thing here is it's the subject who's having to do this. There are no societal formulae or sources of normative authority telling them this is how you cope with this, which is why many of them have, have such big problems in coping with it. They're unlike the third category, the um, people who end up being meta-reflexives, who are discontented with what the family presents them with as opportunities. No, they don't want to run the family shop. They don't want to follow mother in being an engineer and father in being a photographer or, or whatever. Um, and already at school, and I haven't done this research, I would love somebody to do it on secondary school um, pupils. Um, already they are looking out for groups that represent what does matter to them. Uh, and, you know, these, they, they may get it wrong. They don't know enough about themselves. They don't know enough about society. And, and this is where you get people who make the wrong choice of vocation, not because it's a bad choice, but it's just not the choice for them. Um, later they have to revise it because they realize it's, it's not for them and they do no more. But this making of mistakes, late vacations, second starts, is going to become more and more of our pattern of sort of socialization in people's 20s. And then we have the really sad cases. Um, uh, if any of you have read um, The Reflexive Imperative, um, think of, um, what did I call her? Sonia, uh, who was a, a Pakistan, from a Pakistani, mig well, Bangladeshi migrant family who moved to Coventry in Britain. Um, for whatever reasons, uh, her birth mother went off taking the three sons, Islamic family, very significant, she took the boys, left Sonia, uh, age 10, and somehow Sonia's father thought um, it was her fault, or he scapegoated her. And she had a, a very, very abusive, in, in the sense of verbal abuse, not, and sometimes physical violence, but not sexual. Um, and all she wanted to do was get away. Um, and this affected her reflexivity, because whereas all the other groups have an agenda. The communicative reflexives, people who initiate a reflexive thought but need members of their close community to confirm that they have reached the right conclusion. Um, the autonomous, who do it independently and are very self-confident about this. And the meta-reflexives, who are very critical about the society itself and their own activities in it. They can all plan courses of action. They can all move ahead. Whereas this group who have um, suffered relational evils um, in their natal background, their main priority is get out of here. Get out of here fast. Not yet addressing the question on what do I do once I've got out or if I get out. So they have disengaged from the family.
that they're finding it very difficult to re-engage anywhere else. So they're incapable of completing what the internal conversation is for. This is just my personal summary of what I think it's doing. Now, it's, our internal conversations can be about anything. They can be utterly trivial. What shall I wear tomorrow? What shall we eat tonight? Completely trivial. Uh, but there is a seriousness that <coughs> we will think about um, on and off, more when we are under pressure um, than not, um, in which we, we are just doing these three things, but they're probably three of the most important things we do as social subjects. We're trying to define and dovetail our concerns, what we, we regard as internal goods. It's no good just having a concern, you know. I care about society, I care about the community. Uh, a single person has to do something, or even a small group or a neighborhood has to do something. I've called it a project, if you think that's too precise and sounds like the market, call it something else and it doesn't matter. But something that you are dedicated as a form of micropolitics to doing. Now this can be a food bank, it can be visiting the, the elderly, like the San Juan San de Paul. Um, it, it can be any project which relationally with others and playing a very important part, um, David and I were talking about this morning, in building up civil society on a basis of subsidiarity at the meso level. So it's all of those those things. Um, and the subject's personal aim, and then if they become a couple or, or join a cause, it can be anything from Greenpeace to religious confraternity, um, what practices, concrete day-to-day -day practices, having used our practical reason, can represent for us, sorry, Bella, um, a sustainable and satisfying modus vivendi. And this will be an individual thing, a couple thing, a small group thing, and the else will not be the same for everybody, of course, and there's no reason why, why it should be. So, <coughs> I keep doing that, don't I? <laughs> so, now, these are the successful cases, they're the majority of cases, but let's just notice two things about them before I'll finish on um, the growing number of percentage of, of young subjects who can't develop a satisfactory and sustainable modus vivendi. Um, the two things, um, being that depending on which kind of reflexivity they practice most, and we all practice all of them, this is not a typology, it's a dominant mode. I can give you a funny example of that, you know, somebody wants, um, wants one about how we all do use all of them. And just a, a, a simple one, I know nothing about what happens under the car with the car engine. Anything goes wrong with the car, well, let's hope it's still moving. I drive it to a garage and I become a com communicative reflexive. I'm saying to the garage engineer, what's wrong with it? It just, and he says, well, what is wrong with it? It just doesn't sound good. Uh, or it's not working properly. And um, this is very interesting because while we don't have to define terms linguistically in our own conversations internally, we can have very idiosyncratic meanings for, for certain things. 
uh, when we're engaged in external communication, then we have to use standardized syntax and um, standardized semantics. We cannot have our own private words. So the communicative reflexives will um, head for working with people, um, nursing, primary school teaching, caring professionals will be where their preferences lie. And they will usually stay. And they will be performing a huge role for social integration uh, within the neighborhood, within the family, and within the occupational structure. Whereas the autonomous reflexives are confident independents, uh, these are the ones who are still heading for the banks and the big bucks. Uh, they want to make money, they're certainly not financially indifferent. They don't see anything wrong with modern banking. They don't see anything wrong with mainstream neoliberal economics. And therefore, they're fairly stable as a proportion of the population. The meta-reflexives are growing and um, they occupationally um, take advantage of new opportunities. That's why I mentioned Green, green Peace a minute ago. Um, because they make a discovery, one of the subjects I was interviewing, went to the university's career office and the career officer told her well, look, you've been active in Greenpeace since you were 15. Why don't you take a year internship, yeah, where, where you go and work small, you get paid a small amount, and you get experience of what that job entails. And uh, this young woman said, great, I just didn't know that you could do this. So there's an opportunity. She knows her concerns. She is not deterred as a meta-reflexive by the fact that she will not earn a great deal. And the last I heard from her, because we stayed in, in touch, uh, she was doing a, a project in the Amazon about sustainability or replaceability of the rainforests. Um, now, what I want to end on, because these are all personal success stories. And um, they're socially useful in different ways. We can talk some more this afternoon about tendential effects of some of these categories growing. Uh, I'd just like to finish on, on some sort of personal tragedy side um, of loss of social integration and difficulties of socialization when it is not where I started off from, just a matter of internalization. So uh, to end up with, um, let's just have a look at, is that working? Yeah, yeah good. Um, a young girl called Joanna, I actually interviewed all these um, undergraduates each year throughout their first degree. Now, in year one, as Joanna comes, enters university, um, you can see she has a very supportive network, the kind of, and she is an identifier, she's a communicative reflexive, so she has home friends. Most of her home friends are thinking they'd like to go into teaching, Joanna, too, is attracted to teaching and starts getting some classroom practice. Her home friends, friends at home, are known by her family, liked by her family, welcomed to family events. Um, and Joanna herself is very attached to uh, both her brothers, sisters, and mother and father. The mother is special. She is her interlocutor, the first person to whom 
Johanna will go to get completion for her thoughts. It's not that she has no internal conversation, but she reaches a conclusion. It can be trivial. Uh, you know, am I budgeting well in my college, uh, in residence, at university? Um, or it can be, you know, should I be serious about this guy that I met at university? She will talk to her mother about that. So this looks, you know, a really good scenario for reproduction. This looks like one of Pierre Bourdieu's people who is going to go on reproductively to become a teacher, which one of her parents was, the other is linked to education. Uh, and it will just be a story, just like his 1994, uh, 1964 book, <coughs> the 66 book, uh, no, 94, 64 one was Les Héritiers. She would be an inheritor of this teaching family and home friends who want to enter this teaching environment. Uh, La Reproduction, 1966, looks as though it's going ahead until we get to year three. And the colours are what have got superimposed. Okay, it's easier for you to see that one. Uh, the colours have got superimposed are the things that have happened since year one. So, what has? Well, not only does she have home friends, and she's very faithful to them, but she has acquired university friends. Natural, probably much more pronounced in this British context, where to go to university for 85% of them means going to a town different from your hometown. And I know it's very different here for, and in Italy and in Greece for all sorts of reasons. Um, so that effect would not be as, as pronounced here. Uh, the university friends, well, they are all very similar in this. They can't wait to get to London, to the bright lights, the discos, um, and so on. What are they going to do in London? Well, they don't want to do something tame, like teaching. Uh, the excitements of marketing. Now, remember, Joanna was a communicative. She is not after the money, though, if she goes to London, she'll need a good deal more of it, just for housing, living. Uh, so, Joanna starts considering marketing. Now, she's still very attached to her family, but her family, remember, wanted to go down the teaching trail. The family, you'll see there's no arrow here, family is not at all enthusiastic about marketing for, for many reasons. And this leaves poor Joanna stuck between my background, which socialized me, my primary socialization, and my foreground, and my immediate future, which is my, you know, um, socialization as a university student. You want to keep, you care about both of them, is that you are virtually immobilized. Uh, you cannot plan a course of action that doesn't lead you away from the family and towards the university friends. And then you have second thoughts, this down in interminable tape recordings. You have second thoughts. But my university friends, you know, they will, if they haven't done so already, they will meet and, and they will <coughs> marry or, or not, but they will, um, you know, become couples. Um, where's the place for Joanna in this? Um, and they just hesitate and hesitate and basically procrastinate. 
they're passive in that sense that they would much rather uh, postpone decision making. So this young woman, very likable, had solved her problem, her socialization problem, while she was at university by spending holidays, vacations, back home, working at home with the family, and term time, obviously, semester time, with her university friends. She can't do that now she's out in the world. Uh, and so the danger is that this is where the, uh, you know, the Facebooks and the social media will be encouraging more and more because they do manipulate a form of self-presentation which is meant to be celebrity lifestyle. Uh, they're encouraging a drift away from the old forms of social integration and family and community. And it's very difficult to see there being an end to this within the foreseeable future. But I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your patience.